I was born 25th of September, 66, um, at St. Mary's Hospital, Paddington, in the UK, to my dad and my mom. Um, I spent the first four years of my life in the UK. Then came back to Nigeria, started uh, nursery school, when I think St. Martin's, then St. Catherine's, um, then secondary school. You know, it was a good time. You know, um, kids, cousins, friends, playing around the whole place. Yeah, it was a good time. Although Nigeria was still good. And it was still uh, a great place. In the, that was the early 70s. You know, Nigeria was a, a very different place, you know, to, to, to where it is today. It's a much um, simpler place, you know. So those were the good old times, good old years. There was a very popular film in 1987 called Wall Street, right, uh, Michael Douglas. And that kind of fueled a lot of people's interest in investment banking. Not, but not a lot of people knew about investment banking then. Um, I remember a friend of mine, uh, Tinder Dumero, came to see me and talked about friends who were working in the city. I think kind of like, oh, I, didn't, I didn't really get it at the time. But as time evolved, you know, um, I got to understand the, the profession. I fell in love with it. Um, in fact, I studied financial economics specifically to pursue that. In fact, I remember when, when I, um, you know, sometimes you read a chapter and you read it again and you read the thing refuses to enter and I would stop to motivate myself. I would go dress up like a banker, you know? And so if you are going to be like this, you have to read this thing. Take the suit off and go back. It's like self-motivating yourself. So yeah, it was, it was something that I wanted to do. And, you know, I thank God that, you know, I got there. Okay, so let me start from the let me start from the UK. Um, I don't think I, I would be where I am if I didn't work under Paul Stevenson, who was uh, global managing director for Moody's, um, Moody's Investor Services. So when he when he set up uh, what is popularly known as a structured investment vehicle uh, with his partner Paul Secchia, who's Italian. Um, I was recruited to join them. I was, I think, about the fourth or fifth recruit. And he had a profound, um, let me say, interest. I remember the first time he called me and said, I am going to give you value. And from then, every day, we will spend at least two to three hours going on one transaction, just to make me understand securitization. Um, so that's that. And, you know, he's still, we're still in touch. He's retired now um, and done very well for himself. Um, moving then, I would say, actually before him, there was another guy, a Nigerian, a friend of mine today, Dele Babade, who was one of the first of us in our time um, to enter the banking sector. He, he went into, um, it was uh, Samuel Montague then, uh, as it was called. And, you know, that was also very inspiring. And then in coming to Nigeria, I can't, I mean, obviously I can't not mention, I cannot but mention, you know, Tony, uh, Tony Lumilu, because obviously, you know, um, he is one of the guys, the main guy that actually, um, so sort of like pulled me into, Nigeria, you know, it's, he always tells me, says, um, when we met, it was like I met a woman and I had to, I had to chase her, <laughs> you know, that you have to come to Nigeria. And, um, you know, and say, come run 
you know, the investment banking arm. That's just after Standard Trust bought um, UBA. Um, and that's, you know, that's how I came into the country. Most people here will tell you that um, DLM has a learning culture. Um, I think for us, what has kept a lot of people here, and, and I'm proud to say that because quite a few people who are even doing well in the system or in the, in the market today, came from the shop. Um, just like you know, a lot of us also came through UBA. Um, so, being able to learn um, has been one principal attribute that people obviously ascribe to the shop. Um, the culture is very open. Um, if you look around you, you can see it's pretty, you know, just open. We don't work in cubicles and closed doors and whatever. We try to have a very open uh, culture approachable also, I think it's also important. People feel that, you know, when you can approach someone, um, it's easy for you to then learn and pick up, you know, um, ideas. Um, and I think the other thing that, that, that I think is, that's actually evolved from the shop um, is being able to teach people to have the courage to think outside the box, right? Uh, be more of a solution uh, person than problem person. So in other words, always looking for ways to solve problems rather than, ah, this is a problem. Ah, they won't allow us. No, no, no. Everything is permissible. You just need to think about how to make it happen. Everything you've mentioned there, are all opportunities uh, for the next decade. Absolutely. Climate change brings about what, you know, green bonds, blue bonds, you know. Um, technology is going to be an absolute disruptor over the next 10 years, right? Um, banking as we know it today would not be banking in our 20 years time, it would be very different, all right? It'll be a lot more fragmented again uh, because you can see with, with uh, you know, digitalization um, that, you know, payment banks will come up. You know, it's going to be a very different system. Um, for our industry, um, I've, I've said it before, it's not the first time I'm saying this, Africa is the future. It's inevitable. So one of the advantages of the, the trade agreement will be to allow um, easier access, right, for companies like DLM or any other company to be able to grow their footprint across Africa, right? Um, and I, I see that as a, you know, um, uh, a great opportunity, not just for industry, it's actually across board, you know? Obviously there are issues to do with language barriers, but that can be overcome easily by, you know, uh, hiring a lot of the locals uh, in the different countries. But would the services that we provide, would they be required in other countries? Absolutely, yes. Um, obviously, there'll be lots of um, regulatory hurdles to go through, policy changes and so on and so forth. But, um, you know, anyone who looks at Africa as a continent and can't see the, you know, the, um, let me say, the uh, a projectile of growth, um, you know, is missing the big elephant in the room, so to speak. It's, it's, I mean, the, the continent has always been a difficult one, and it would it always be, but um, reality is, you know, it is, it is overcoming those challenges that gives you that opportunity. Um, when I look at, you know, the banks of today, for instance, the GTs, the um, Zenits, that are throwing, you know, 200 billion, you know, net profit. Now, just think about it. We're in 2020. 
and I think it was in 2004, which will now be 16 years ago, that Sunday woke up one morning and said, banking consolidation, 25 billion for capital. Now, 25 billion at the time sounded like, how? Today, it's like a month's pay. It's a lot of difference, right? When you think about it, it's like a month's pay. But 16 years ago, a lot of banks failed because they could not find 25 billion. So it tells you, you know? And if we didn't have the problem uh, of currency devaluation, which I still don't understand that, I think it's, I don't know, uh, I mean, maybe I, I shouldn't say this on camera, but, you know. Anyway, it's something I just don't get as to why somebody just wakes up and says, well, now is on a value, you should now be 500. Then they wake up again, you know, two years later and say, oh, the value should be 700. But I'm just saying, assuming you didn't have that kind of devaluation, could you imagine how the kind of value those institutions will have? Because today, right, you will say that's 100 billion, then you will divide it by 380 or 4, whatever, whatever number it is. But assuming it was just been divided by 100, let's say it was, we've been able to maintain 100 to 1. Tell us what kind of value can exist. Yeah, so um, that kind of growth is is why Africa remains interesting, despite all the challenges and issues. Yeah, so I'll take you back to two thousand and one. Um, had a job offer from IFC, uh, you know, which is the private arm of the World Bank Group, um, to, to start work in DC, Washington. And I had another job offer to join Halifax Bank of Scotland as a uh, fund manager managing complex um, MBS. One job, which is the HBS, HBS uh, Halifax Bank of Scotland, Good money. Good, good, good money. Uh, the other one was like an international civil servant, right? It was okay, but it was like comparing chalk and cheese. And, you know, and I could say that the decision that was taken at that crossroad, you know, is what got me here to where I am today. Um, so every friend I had that I spoke to would say, Dude, go for the money. That's a lot of money. Um, and to be honest, you know, you sit down, you write the advantages of this one, advantage of that one, you try and you can't. It's chalk and cheese. They're just two different roles to have. You can't compare them. To be honest, I actually put the um, offer signed in the mailbox. And I said, okay, I find it. It's like a month. I've taken my decision, that's it. I'm going for the money, whatever. And by the way, I was expecting my first uh, child, right? Uh, who was like a couple of months away from birth. You know, when you go to sleep and your body, you know, that's why there's something called an inner spirit that just tells you now, mm -mm, that is not your direction. So you're not sleeping well, you're still turning and turning, you're not comfortable. Your heart is still not there. So I remember that the next morning, I mean, I thought, you know, I put in the office, gone, I'm, I'm done. They didn't even give me shares. Ah. And I remember that day, lovely day, just like this, sunny day. Um, back then I had a 968 uh, Porsche convertible, you know, so I, I decided to just drive to the country, clear my head. And then that, this thing came to my head. It said, do you want to create or do you want to trade? Um, and it just made it so clear that I want to create, you know, um, let the next generation, let them trade what our generation have created. My dear, I turned around, went back home, called the Hartley headhunter and said, you know what, I'm not taking the job anymore. I don't think it was five minutes. The bank called me up 
right? And that job, they've been looking for somebody for about six to seven months. I interviewed, I interviewed that afternoon, that day. I got the job before I got back to the office. Thanks to Paul Stevenson. Yeah? And the guys called me up and said, look, this is a job, it's a very special job because it's not that common to have, you know, um, we, we call the role buyers, people who buy assets for, for, for banks. Um, so they asked me, said, you know, do you want more money? Well, you know, you bring to store about as much money as you want. I mean, you know, the guy who ran the shop, all right, or the team, worked only three days a week. Now, that's very unusual in, in that part of the world. But that was how boisterous and financially viable they were. Anyway, um, they asked me that question if I wanted more money. And I, I remember the answer. And this is it, still verbal team. Uh, almost what 20 years back now I said no it's not about the money you know, it's, just, it's just what I want to do you know and I just and ever since then my focus has been what has been on creating institutions so um, and that's what I would love to do it's, I would like to I mean I give an example someone like I, I admire a lot is like I said Peter side and what he did with IBTC or what Jim Ovia was able to do with Zenith Right? or Shimon Balogun was able to do with FCMB. Yeah? We have a lot of people, we have a lot of population, so I'm hoping that I end up being one of those who be able to create an institution that becomes something that I can step away from, you know, and it takes a life of its own. Still to get there, I've still yet to get there, but um, I would say something that at least I'm proud of. Um, I remember once Andrew Ali, who is a good friend of mine, um, you know, said, you know what, this is one of the unsung heroes of, uh, of IFC. We had like an IFC gathering. Um, many people don't know, for instance, that I was heavily, heavily involved in creating this bond market that is now, what, I don't know how many trillion it is, right? But um, my, my role in making sure that market happened, I remember when I first came, then I was at IFC, and I came and I you know, looked at the fact that there wasn't a bond market here. I know that people like Tola Mubalari, as I call him, my well, you know, um, had tried, um, and it just failed miserably. And I took it upon myself and I said, you know what, we're going to set up a bond market in this country. This market that you see today cost us 150. Oh yeah, it was 150, 150,000. And it came from Canada. That was the cost of setting this whole thing up. Yeah. And uh, we would come in. That time I was based in South Africa. Uh, we'll come in, you know. I remember the, the first meeting I had was with. Uh, um, Lanu Ajay, you know, and Prof 2004. And I remember I said, we've, we've come to, you know, we've come to set up a bond market, you know, where people can invest for 10, 20, 30 years. He laughed so hard, he almost fell off his chair because at the time it was totally inconceivable to think about the possibility of buying Nigerian bonds that had that kind of duration. It's inconceivable. So, to look at the market today and how it's actually matured. Um, even I remember um, IMF at the time had actually mentioned confidentially that Nigeria shouldn't try and do that. That Nigeria is too volatile a country. That it can't have a bond market. It's just not possible. Or too volatile, too whatever. But today, so yes, if there's one thing at least I think I've done so far for the country. You know, um, that, you know, at least I quietly enjoy is that market that has made so many institutions 
you know, wealth and, you know, I helped the Nigerian government. My mom, my dad, kids, my children were important to me. Yeah. It's family. Most important, family. And also, you know, the people I work with, because I also see them as family. You know? Um, and I think that starts being able to anchor me, you know, uh, even when I'm. Yeah, I would say that, certainly. Family. I'm trying to think if I were to give my advice, would I, would I, it's like the way this question is like, would I have done anything differently? More or less, you know? Um, no, I don't think so. Don't think so, no. I would have done anything differently. Um, I couldn't have advised myself any different, you know? I, by the time I, I got into my um, 20s, you know, especially from my mid 20s, you know, I became extremely focused and I knew exactly what I wanted. To do and I've followed that ever since. Well, what I would say to any 20 year old right now is you know, I would say to people, what makes people successful in life? We all do it every day, Oops. but a lot of us don't know. You left somewhere to come here, you had an address 66 to 68 Alexander, it was a specific place, and you needed to be there at a time. And you did everything you had to do to make sure you get there. Yeah? Imagine you left your address and you had, you didn't know where you were going to. What would happen? You'd just be all over the place, exactly. So to me, the advice I always give to young people and anybody is the first thing you need to do is you must know where you're going before you leave home. All right? Even if you have to sit in your house for weeks or years, to decide where you're going. Once you've decided this is what I want to do, this is where I want to go, yeah, it becomes easier because you become focused, you know exactly where you're going. If you're going on this road and they block it, what would you do? You will come back, you look on the road because you know where you're going. So the most important thing in achieving success is you need to define your success. Where, what is it that I want? Then go for it. So, um, the other way I can say it is like, like I say to my son, you know what? Always have a dream. Always have a dream. And when you fulfill that dream, create another. That's the only way. And it has to be your dream, your passion. And whatever anybody tells you, irrelevant. Your dream, your passion, go for it. all have different parts to play, you know, during the journey. So, put it this way, in the early part of your life, right, uh, education is important, right, um, and stuff like that. Um, when you're going into your career, you know, ability to be diligent, ability to, to be able to, you know, be focused, analyze, etc., becomes important. What becomes more important is interpersonal skills. The ability to relate with people, you know. Um, some would even say your ability to be um, unemotional. No, you know, don't show no passion. You're not, you're not excited, and you, you don't get excited, and you don't get bored. You just even kill, right? So, as your career evolves, different skills come through. Hard work becomes less of an issue as you grow older, because at that time, you created a structure that allows you know, uh, a machinery to operate. But then relationships become more important and your ability to maintain and uh, keep your relationships warm across board, from political spheres to you know, government to private sector, etc. you must be able to do that. So there's no one thing that 
leads to success. It's just this, you know, as you, certain things are important at different times of your, of, you know, through, through the spectrum of, of life. I, I, th I think that's a, that's a, that's a, uh, you know, if I, if I had to do that, it, because the thing is, people's success are based on very different things, you know? Um, so some will tell you, yeah, you know, hand of God, favor of God. Some will tell you hard work. Some will say, you know, connect. It's, 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 there, there's no, I, I don't think there's any hard and fast rule, honestly. Um, I've always believed in the sequence of events. You know, things happen for a reason. Um, but you can't sit down on your chair and say, well, things happen for a reason, so I believe that something will just come and happen to me. No. Um, but, you know, you, you, as a person, you must have, um, you know, you have to have a goal, you have to have a drive um, towards that goal. Now, all the other things you've mentioned, hard work, diligence, uh, favor of God, uh, connections, etc. All those things will come and play within your, you know, within your um, your journey um, towards, you know, where you're going to. Um, but I think the most important thing, if I'd say, what would it be that would guide a person to success? Like I said earlier, right, is that you as a person have to decide what you want. So I yeah, said, I always ask questions. So you know, when people ask the question. Where do you want to be in five years? Where do you want to be in 10 years? The clearer you are on that answer, the higher the probability of you getting it. Most people will say, I want to be rich. Okay, great. How do you want to be wealthy? Uh, uh, uh. So the people that, and again, it also depends on what you also define as success. Success doesn't necessarily mean wealth. No, there are all kinds of exact measures of it. But to me, the most important thing is you must know what, like I said, the clearer you are as to where you want to go, the higher the probability of your achievement. And if you find most people who have been successful, um, you know, they, that clarity of what they want to achieve comes pretty early. If I had all the money in the world, I'll be bored. Think about it. If you could do anything you want to do, anytime you want to do it, whenever you want to do it, what do you think will happen? Exactly. Analysis paralysis. You just get bored. So the reason why it's never good to be in that sort of, sort of situation is that you find out that most people, when they get to a certain point in their lives, will tell you they don't do it for the money. They do it for the love of what they do. Yeah. Right? So in, initially, it gets to a point, you know, yes, the house, whatever, but after all that, then it's like, for instance, you know, I talked about the job, yeah? And I told you, I said I was, I, at the time I had a 968 Porsche. When I was thinking about that job, I was saying to myself, okay, so I take this money now and I'm making this big money. What's going to happen? Okay, I'll change from a Porsche to a Ferrari. I will go from the one house to another house. And I looked at myself, I said, is that it? Because then life has no meaning. You see? So to me, um, I've never done this for the money. I don't, you know, I do it because I enjoy it. I do it for the fact that I want to see an institution grow. Of course, when it grows, it grows and it becomes, you know, big net worth and whatever. But in reality, you're still not going to have more than one or two meals a day. You can't be in one on one car. You're not going to sleep on one on one bed. Right? You always wear clothes. That's it. 